Uh, very well done. We do want to get rolling. Um, before we get started with this 1015 session, just a reminder, uh, if you are going to be uh, eating lunch with us, which you're certainly welcome to do, uh, I've got two people that have given me $5, so I can tell you right now that's not going to cover it. Um, so if, if you uh, would be so kind as to give your donation, either myself or Daryl, we would appreciate that. Um, again, if you want to make a, a donation to the conference, there's a, a, a container right there. Um, we're going to get started with the 1015 session, and we're going to have uh, Brother Dave Reed. He's going to come back and teach us. I asked him to teach this session on the topic of Sola Scriptura, the revolution's dangerous idea. And uh, he's going to come now and explain to us about this. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me start by giving you sort of an outline of, of what we're going to cover, and then we'll, we'll jump in from there. Let's open in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word. We thank you that it's flawless. We thank you you've preserved it for us without error. We pray, Lord, that our hearts would yield to your word, not our own opinions, not man's traditions, but simply your word. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. So what I want to cover this morning is a couple points. First, we'll talk about how the, the Reformation elevated Scripture above church tradition and councils. We'll demonstrate that the Textus Receptus and its translation into the vernacular languages of Europe was the driving force of the Reformation. And then we'll talk about how the principle of sola scriptura was a threat to the Roman structure, but also allowed for all manner of different biblical interpretations. So if you're following along in the notes, if you would turn to page 35, and we'll start by talking about Satan's warfare against the Word of God. Now, as you think about the Bible, one of the things that, that's clearly the case is that the Bible reveals Satan's defeat and destruction from the very beginning. Accordingly, it's easy to understand why he's hostile to the Word of God. So Genesis 3.15, if we start really at the beginning, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, just so you have the, the metaphor there, what's being said there, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel, it, it, it's the metaphor of the serpent being crushed by the seed of the woman, right? He, he nips the heel and causes some minor wound, but it's his destruction. That's foretold from Genesis 3. Romans 16, verse 20, and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Colossians 2.15 And having spoiled principalities and powers, having defeated them and then plundered them, and ha having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. It's not just their destruction, it's the broadcasting of their destruction to the universe. Revelation 12, 12, Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And what's going on there is that when you think about the 70th week, there's a point in time when Michael and his angels war with the devil and his angels. The devil and his angels lose. They're cast down to the earth. And what it specifically says is the heavens are going to rejoice at that time because Satan is cast out, and Satan has great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And then in Revelation 20, verse 2, And he laid hold on that dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Revelation 20, verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. After a thousand years of punishment, they still were there, they weren't destroyed and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. 
So what those verses are telling you, let's take the last couple there, is Satan's cast out of heaven. He knows that he has a short time. He's then imprisoned for a thousand years. He gets out to lead a rebellion. And where does he end up eventually? The lake of fire where he is tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, if you're Satan, and that's what the Bible says, how do you feel about that? I mean, there's no way you would like it. So Satan has had a long-standing hostility to the Word of God. It's all about his defeat. It's all about his destruction. In fact, the mystery information is Satan's foolishness. What God did is he kept one secret from Satan. And what Satan does at the cross is, is he doesn't realize this at the time, but when Christ sheds his blood and dies for the body of Christ and purchases that body of Christ, that body of Christ is going to replace Satan and his minions in the heavens. So it demonstrates Satan's foolishness. So you can understand why Satan would hate the Word of God. So that leads to the next bullet point. Satan's hostility toward the Word of God has manifested itself in a multitude of different attacks on the Word of God throughout the ages. He has questioned God's Word, Genesis 3, verse 1. Misquoted it, Genesis 3, verse 1. Denied it, Genesis 3, verse 4 hid it for lengthy periods of time, 2 Kings 22. Physically destroyed it, Jeremiah 36. Misapplied it outside of context, Matthew 4. That's when Satan tries to tempt Christ in the wilderness. Corrupted it, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and created counterfeits of it, 2 Thessalonians 2. Satan's intense hatred of the Word of God causes him to oppose it throughout time in any manner of attack that he can perform at that time. He misquotes it, he corrupts it, he denies it, he creates counterfeits, he tries to hide it. Anything he can do to prevent the Word of God from being effective, that's what he does. So now let's fast forward to the Middle Ages. During the Middle Ages, Rome had forbidden possession of the Old and New Testaments and the translation thereof. In other words, it was wrong. It was imp- you couldn't even possess them. You couldn't even own them. Since the church claimed the authority to forbid the Bible, it was obviously claiming to be greater than the Bible. That is what the church was saying is, you can't possess this. You can't possess the Old Testament. You can't possess the New Testament. You can't have a translation of it. And the church clearly put itself in a position saying, we're superior to the Bible. We command you not to have it. So let me, let me prove that to you. The Council of Toulouse, which was in 1229, this is Canon 14. We prohibit also that the laity should be permitted to have the books of the Old and New Testament. The laity is anyone other than the clergy. In other words, laity, you commoners, (laughs) you're not allowed to have the Old and New Testament because only bad would come of it. (laughs) Right? You would misbehave, you would do something you shouldn't, and therefore you can't have it. Now notice the last part of that quote. It started with, we prohibit also that the laity should be permitted to have the books of the Old and New Testament, and it ends with, but we most strictly forbid, here's what's even worse, we most strictly forbid they're having any translation of these books. So the first thing they're saying is, look, you can't have the Old and New Testament at all, but what you really can't have is a translation thereof. Because if you have a translation thereof, you might be able to read it and understand it. We don't like you having even the ones you can't understand, but you definitely can't have the one that you might understand. That's what they're saying. The Council of Tarragona does something very similar. Now let's skip to the next point. Not only was the Bible forbidden from the people, but the Roman Mass itself was distant. Brian touched on this yesterday. The Roman Mass was in Latin, and continued to be in Latin until the 1960s. The typical attendee at a Mass would not understand it, and therefore could not possibly be edified. 
So think with me about 1 Corinthians 14. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Even so, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek ye that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. In other words, what's being said here is this. If someone is speaking in tongues in a language that you don't understand, it's as if they're a barbarian. You, you can't understand it. You can't get anything out of it. And therefore, it's impossible for you to be edified. Edification is impossible if you don't even understand what's being said. The simplest proof of that is when you're flipping through the channels and there's never anything intelligent to watch, what happens when you come to one of the channels that's in a foreign language do you that you don't know? Do you watch that for an hour? You don't for what reason? You can't understand anything! Right? I mean, it, it's just, to, you're, it's a barbarian to you, right? It's just utterly nonsense. Well, just pause for a minute and think about that. The Latin Mass itself was that way. So people would go, sit there for a long time, and what would they understand? Nothing. During the Middle Ages, the laity was largely disconnected from the Bible. Many monastic orders, such as the Benedictines, placed a high value on detailed, extensive study of the Bible. Yet such a knowledge was simply impossible for most ordinary Christians, most of whom could neither read nor afford to buy a manuscript of the Bible. The advent of printing would alleviate the latter problem, although Johann Gutenberg's first printed Bibles cost far more than the large houses of his day. So what had happened is they had forbidden the Bible. You weren't allowed to have it. You definitely couldn't have a translation. The monks were studying it, but for the common man, they couldn't read. Right? So that was a problem. And then even if they could, they couldn't afford the Bible. So if you're, on, if you're following the notes, look at page 37, the first bullet at the top. The common man during the Middle Ages faced multiple barriers that kept him from the Word of God. So there's five here that I've listed. The first is possession of the Bible was forbidden by the church. So if you were, if you were following the dictates of the church, you weren't even allowed to have it. So it's a non-starter, right? You just weren't even allowed to possess it, so you, you wouldn't have it. But let's assume you ignored that. Well, the next barrier you had is that most men couldn't read at that time. You're not allowed to have the Bible. You don't know how to read. Even if you could read, what was the Bible in at that time? It was in Latin, which was not the spoken language that people used. So even if you had the ability to read, which was rare, you would then have to learn to read in Latin, which was not commonly spoken. Let's say you got through all that. The Bible manuscripts were expensive. Even at the time when, the, when Gutenberg first starts printing, how much did the manuscripts cost? Describe it as a large house. Well, how many people have disposable income where you can just, in your petty cash, <laughs> purchase a large house? Now, let's say you overcame all of that. You know what you would then have? You would then be able to read, in Latin, Jerome's Vulgate, which was the wrong text. So often, you know, generals like to have multiple lines of defense. If our first line of defense fails, then our second line will catch them. And if our second fails, then our third will catch them. Do you see how there's five lines of defense there that prevent the common man from any access to the Word of God? The church forbids it. People can't read. They, even if they can read, they can't read Latin. The manuscripts are too expensive. And if you get past all that, you're reading the wrong text. And so what happens during the Middle Ages, just the reality of it is, is that the vast majority of mankind is alienated, is distant, is separated from the Word of God. It's not available to them. Let's talk about Sola Scriptura. Contrary to the doctrine of the Roman Church, 
Wycliffe, Huss, Luther, and Tyndale all viewed Scripture as the ultimate authority. William Chillingworth put it thus, the Bible, the Bible alone, is the religion of the Protestants. And that, in its essence, is the idea of sola scriptura. Scripture alone is the authority. It's not anything else. It's not man's traditions. It's not church councils. It's the Word of God. And I want to demonstrate that to you for, for each of these men. Let's start with Wycliffe. Many of Wycliffe's doctrines were far in advance of the age in which he lived. Now remember, Wycliffe was born in 1320. So he's born 200 years before Luther nails the theses to the Wittenberg door. Many of Wycliffe's doctrines were far in advance of the age in which he lived. He anticipated the principles of a more enlightened generation. The scripture alone is truth, he said. And his doctrine was formed on that foundation alone. John Huss. This is a description of what Huss faced when he was being tried for his beliefs. Huss was subjected to every kind of persuasion and ill treatment to induce him to retract what he had taught, namely that salvation is by grace through faith and apart from the works of the law. So one of the things they really hate about Huss is Huss is saying you can be saved by grace through faith, and they're like, stop it! Quit it! We'll give you a chance to retract! Notice, here's what happens with Huss. Apart from the works of the law, and that no title or position, however exalted, can make a man acceptable to God without godliness of life, with humility and a rare courage and ability. He steadfastly maintained that he was ready to retract anything that he had taught, provided it could be shown from Holy Scripture that he was wrong, but that he would withdraw nothing that he saw to be taught in the Word of God. Who's that sound like? Sounds exactly like Luther, doesn't it? That's exactly what Luther says at the Diet of Worms. So we'll skip what, what Luther says, because you already know that. Let's talk about William Tyndale. Here's a quote from what happens in his life. Not long after, Master Tyndale happened to be in the company of a certain divine recounted for a learned man. And in communing and disputing with him, he drove him to that issue that the said great doctor burst out into these blasphemous words. We were better to be without God's laws than the Pope's. So Tyndall's having a discussion with this learned man. The man says, we can live without God's laws, but the thing we really, really need is the Pope's laws. Here's what Tyndall says. Master Tyndall, hearing this, full of godly zeal, and not bearing that blasphemous saying, replied, I defy the Pope and all his laws. And added, if God spared him life ere many years, he would cause a boy that driveth the plow to know more of the scripture than he did. Now think about that quote for a minute. How's Tyndall possibly going to do that? I mean, we talked before about all those barriers that kept the common man from the word of God. How is Tyndall going to cause the boy that driveth the plow to know more of the scriptures than someone that, whose actual daily life is spent studying them? The only way that's possible is if Tyndall translates the word of God into the language that the boy driving the plow can understand. That's what Tyndall's saying there. Debates about biblical interpretation take place in every Christian community, not merely Protestant ones. What distinguishes Protestantism at this point is its principled refusal to allow any authority above Scripture, such as a pope or council. This principle is often affirmed using the Latin slogan, Scriptura ipsius interpres. Scripture is its own interpreter. Whereas Catholicism resolves such tensions through magisterial pronouncements on the part of the teaching authority of the church, Protestantism recognizes no such authority above Scripture. So Jeff touched on this earlier, but the point of sola scriptura is that Scripture is the authority that there is nothing above it. That's the, essentially what sola scriptura is. Now let's talk for a minute about the vernacular languages. One of the things that happens during the Protestant Reformation is that the different Protestant leaders 
made a very intentional decision to communicate to the common man in the vernacular language. And by vernacular, we just simply mean common language. In other words, the language that was commonly spoken among the populace. Let's talk about Luther. Prior to Luther's day, it had been difficult or impossible for a private individual to reach a wide audience. There was no mass media at that time. But with the invention of the printing press and its increased deployment over time, Luther was among the first private citizens with the ability to communicate directly and broadly to the common man. So let's talk about the 95 Theses for a minute. We, t we, we touched on this yesterday, but sometimes there's the idea that Luther tacks up the 95 Theses, and his tacking up the Theses is what causes this information to be widely dispersed throughout Germany and Europe. But that's really not the case. It, it's the equivalent of putting a flyer on a bulletin board. And you know, you know as well as I do, flyers on bulletin boards are largely ignored, right? They don't cause sensations, they don't go viral. But what happens is this. Luther tacks up the theses on the, the door of the Wittenberg church. They're taken and translated, and then most significantly, they are printed and printed and printed and that's what causes the theses to come to the attention of the public at large. Now let's talk a little bit about Luther's dispute with John Tetzel. So when Luther is, is disputing with John Tetzel over the sale of indulgences, and just as a reminder, what the indulgence is, is it's a certificate given by the church that allows you to spend less time in purgatory. You'll spend less time in purgatory suffering for your sins. And what's actually the case is, that, uh, you know, so this obviously is a, is, a, is a fundraising mechanism, right? In other words, as a believer, what's going to happen is you're going to die, and then in order to pay for your sins, you have to spend some amount of time in purgatory to satisfy God's justice. The certificate of indulgence allows you to spend less time there. So what happens is the person gets less suffering, and the church selling them gets the cash. Very simple transaction. Well, part of what happens is people would buy these indulgences. They'd be happy to have them. And then the church would need more fundraising. They need more cash. Well, part of the problem is you already sold the best thing, right? You already gave people the get out of purgatory card. So what they would then do is they would declare the prior indulgences null and void. Yeah. Oops, there was an expiration date on your coupon, sir. I'm sorry, we can't honor that. Right? That's, that, that, that's how it worked. So Luther and others look at this, they're like, this is just craziness. You may remember this, hopefully you don't. There, there's a popular song, I think it was the 70s, Stairway to Heaven. Hopefully none of you know what this is, but I suspect you do. And what's the idea of that? You can buy a stairway to heaven. It's just cash. It's just an utter insult, a mockery of God's justice, that salvation can be bought like something in a, in a market. So that's what's going on with indulgences. So here's what happens. Luther tacks those theses up there, and he does that. He posts them in, in, in Latin. And when he posts them in Latin, it's an invitation to an academic debate, an academic discussion, in other words. So right now in America and around the world, do university professors discuss things with, a, with one another all the time and no one actually cares, right? I mean, how much time do you spend worrying about what people in ivory towers debate with one another? Hopefully none, right? It's totally useless. So Luther posts those in Latin, but someone takes them and they translate them into German, and then they're printed. What Luther did, now after that, Luther himself starts writing in German. When Luther makes the decision that I'm going to participate in this discussion in German, what he's really doing is he's changing the dialogue 
from a dialogue between people in the ivory tower to a dialogue with the populace. When Luther has a dialogue with just the monks, is there any possible way he's going to win? The foreshadowing is, anyone that signs up with Luther, you can leave too! Right? Luther's going down the pathway of being excommunicated. Not hard for the academics to see. Anyone that lines up on Luther's side of the debate can just go with him. Right? So if, if Luther had that dialogue solely in Latin, it's a dialogue he's going to lose. So he decides what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it a public discussion. And that is the point, my personal belief, at which the die is cast. There's no going back for him. Because what he's done is he's breached the sort of academic de decorum, and it's now just not among our little scholar's circle. You've now made it a public issue. And that's the point at which the break, I think, is irrevocable. Here's the next thing Luke, Luther did. Rather than write lengthy academic tomes, so in other words, the other thing that scholars do, is they write things that are so long and ponderous and boring that hopefully no one says, oh, I really got to read that. Right? Luther wrote things that were short and sweet. Luther's Sermon on Indulgence and Grace was an eight-page pamphlet that could be read in ten minutes. Do you see the point? Who's he writing to? Is he writing to the scholars? No, he's writing to the common man. He's writing in their language, and he's writing in a way where they can get it. It's short and to the point. Now here's what that did. That brevity enabled Luther's words to be read by a wide audience. The way printing worked at that time, the way that you and I think about books today, is when a, a book comes out, there's a single publisher that publishes it. No one else can then copy, in other words, someone comes out with a new book, just, I don't know, whatever it is, and it's a hot thing. Can a, nut, can a competing publisher start publishing that exact book? They can't. It would be an infringement of rights. So there's a single publisher to, today that publishes a, spe a specific work. That's not the way that it worked then. What happened then was when one publisher published a work and it was popular, other publishers said, I'm going to publish that too. So think about this with me for a moment. When Luther is writing these really short little things and they become popular, another publisher that wants to make money can just publish these and since they're short, the financial investment they have to make to publish it is small. In other words, if Luther writes his 300 page book and you're the publisher that's saying, hey wait, that sold well, I want to do some of those too, one of the things in the back of your mind is, is there still demand, right? In other words, did those sell out and there's not a demand for any more, or is there still a demand? Well, if they're really short and you can print more cheaply, it's clearly a risk worth taking. So what Luther did, I, I think intentionally, very, very thoughtful about this, he, he's writing these things that are short and sweet that the public can digest, and it allows lots of other publishers across Germany to say, let's publish that as well because we think it'll sell and we can make profit from it. We're on page 39 if you're following along. Luther published his first work in 1516, and by 1520 he was the most prolific living author. So in four years, he becomes the most published author alive. Luther's works outstrip those of any other author by a factor of ten. He outpublished his the most successful of his Catholic opponents by a factor of 30. It just obviously overwhelmed them in terms of popularity. In the first years, 15 to 17 to 1520, the most important readers were to be found among the clergy and local intelligentsia. Remember, he first published the theses in Latin, who would then go on to be leaders in their own right. This was a, the period when a relatively high proportion of the literature of the Reformation was still in Latin the language of clerical conversation. But in the five years after Luther's condemnation at Worms in 1521, 88% of the published editions of his works were in German. So you can see the shift there. After Worms, it's clear that he's on the outs. Brian told you how what he has to do is he have to, has to be kidnapped so that he can stay alive. And then he starts writing in German. 
The Reformation was not driven by Martin Luther's revolutionary doctrinal teaching, including justification by faith. As seen earlier, Luther's doctrinal views were similar to John Huss and the Lollards. In fact, there are many parallels between the lives of John Huss and Martin Luther. So I want to just give you a couple illustrations here, a couple uh, details as to how John Huss's life and beliefs were very similar to Martin Luther. Although Luther was a, a initially critical of Huss's doctrine, he later came to refer to himself as a Hussite. Luther believed that doctrinally he was similar to Huss. When at the height of the Luther affair in 1521, Martin Luther journeyed across Germany to face judgment at the Diet of Worms, he did so under guarantee of safe conduct. Now, you remember we talked about this yesterday? When John Huss was summoned before a council, he was promised safe conduct by Emperor Sigismund, if you recall that. Huss arrives, and they break faith with him. They say, the church has no obligation to keep faith with a heretic, so, sorry, <laughs> psych, <laughs> there's no safe conduct for you. Well, here's what happened. Luther was promised that he would be allowed to arrive and depart unharmed. But there were those among the emperor's entourage who encouraged him to repudiate his promise and have Luther arrested and executed. So in other words, people are encouraging the emperor, yeah, I know you told him that, but look, we've, we've done this before. It's okay. Just, just renege on your promise. Such had been the fate of another heretic, John Huss, a century before, and it was the fate that many of Luther's friends expected for him. Luther himself did not expect to leave worms alive. So when Luther went to the Diet of Worms, he expected to be killed. That was what he anticipated. So here's, here's my point. Huss and Luther have the same views. They're treated exactly the same. They're summoned to the council. They're given the promise of safe conduct. You know the fundamental difference in their lives? Huss, they said, sorry, we're not honoring that. And they, they kill him. Luther, they didn't. So the question becomes for us, what changed? Why was Luther treated differently? I'll suggest to you the following. What seems to have saved Luther was widespread sentiment in Luther's favor that restrained the powers that be from eliminating Luther as they would have liked to have done. Quote, Thus we return to the paradox with which we began this book. Printing was essential to the creation of Martin Luther, but Luther was also a determining shaping force in the German printing industry. Many things conspired to ensure Luther's unlikely survival through the first years of the Reformation, but one of them was undoubtedly print. Books circulating with uncontrollable rapidity throughout the German towns created at least the appearance of a new consensus that the settled will of the German people was that Luther should be heard, this intimidated and sometimes silenced opponents and fortified Luther's far from numerous supporters in the German estates. So what's happening is this. Luther lives after the printing press, and Huss didn't. Right? And so we talked earlier about the circumstances that were in place that helped bring about the Reformation. Well, one of the things that happened is the printing press technology has been developed, and now it's being implemented. And you saw that how in five years, Luther became the most prolific living author alive. What happens, frankly, is this. Luther has enough visible support. There are enough people that think he deserves a fair hearing that the powers that be are confronted with a dilemma. We'd really like to get rid of this guy, just like we'd like to get rid of Huss. We'd like him to just disappear. But if they just make him disappear, what happens? Well, possibly they provoke public outrage, right? Because it's clear of the reason he's being killed. He's being killed because of his views. So what happens is this. Men like to sin in secret, don't they? They would have been happy to execute Luther privately. But what they conclude is they conclude on balance, we'll, we'll let him live. I, my guess is they'd probably like to revisit <laughs> that decision, but, but too late for that. So Luther is, is allowed to survive, and it's in large part due to the printing press. Let's talk about William Tyndale. Now this is a, a, a lengthy quote, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to read it to you. I think it's worthwhile. Finally in this, they be all agreed, 
to drive you from the knowledge of the Scripture, and that ye shall not have the text thereof in the mother tongue, and to keep the world still in darkness, to the intent they might sit in the consciences of the people through vain superstition and false doctrine. And what they're saying there is they don't want you to have the Scripture in, in the mother tongue that you could understand it. Because what that allows them to do, it allows them to sit in your conscience. In other words, if you don't have the Bible in your language, how do you know right from wrong? How do you tell? Well, the answer at that time was the church will tell you. You don't need to worry about what to think. We'll tell you what to think. That's why they didn't want the Bible to be in, in, a, in a native tongue that people could understand. A thousand books had they lever, in other words, rather. A thousand books had they rather to be put forth against their abominable doings and doctrine than that the Scripture should come to light. In other words, you could write a thousand books documenting all their misdeeds. That would be better for them than the Scripture actually coming to light. For as long as they may keep that down, that's the Scriptures, they will so darken the right way with the mist of their sophistry, and so tangle them that either rebuke or despise their abomination with arguments of philosophy, and with worldly similitudes and apparent reasons of natural wisdom. I'm going to skip to the bottom of this paragraph. That though thou feel in thine heart, and art sure how that all is false that they say, Yet couldst thou not solve their subtle riddles? In other words, here's what's happening. There's all this double talk about what the Scriptures really say. But if you can't read them, if you can't quote the text, and the experts tell you, well, you misunderstand it because it really says this. How do you respond to that? It's hard to respond when you can't read the text. This is my personal opinion. You can just take this or leave it. That, that's one of the things that's offensive about when people say the original Greek says such and such. Because what they're doing then is they're setting themselves up as the priest class. You guys don't know Greek, so I'll tell you what it really says. And then how are you supposed to argue with that? Now what that does then, just to be clear, if the scriptures have been preserved only in Greek, how ineffective the Holy Spirit really is. Right? Just, just, let me ask you this. How many of you consider yourselves fluent in biblical Greek, biblical Hebrew, and Chaldean? You know, you're just so adept in those languages, it's like you know, second nature. And the answer is none of us. And the answer of the population of the earth is infinitesimal, right? And so if what God did, if God left his word in simply the original languages, then that is a completely ineffective manner of preserving them since no one speaks those today. Instead, what God did is he preserved them through faithful translations of the original. So what happens today when people say, well, the original Hebrew says this, and the original Greek says that, that's all just utter nonsense is what that is. And, and it's simply that age-old thing of, I'll be your priest. I'll tell you what to think. You come to me because I'm the expert and I'll explain it to you. It's a denial, frankly, of sola scriptura. So let's continue with Tyndale. He's talking about the fact that the experts hid, hid behind the Bible not being in the vernacular. Which thing only moved me to translate the New Testament. Remember the argument that Tyndale had with the, 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 the priest that said, better to be without God's laws than the Pope's laws? This is the thing that motivates Tyndale to translate the New Testament. Because I had perceived by experience how that it was impossible to establish the lay people in any truth except the Scripture were plainly laid before their eyes in their mother tongue. And the idea there simply is that the Bible has to be put in the common languages for people to understand it. Otherwise, you can't establish them in it. Here's what Tyndall was doing. Tyndall was trying to communicate scriptural truth to the common man untrained in Latin, but his adversaries resisted him with spurious arguments. It was a disagreement in English over the meaning of a Latin text. And the observer unfamiliar with Latin 
had no idea who or what to believe. So all the priests are saying one thing. Tyndale says something else. And they're debating about the meaning of a Latin text. So what happens if you're a bystander to this and you speak English? It's meaningless. You, 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 what, what do you make of it? You can't, you can't intellectually engage with it. And oh, by the way, on one side, they have the vast majority of the priests. And they have church councils and tradition. And everything is set up to, to preserve the status quo, to preserve the existing church orthodoxy. Well, just like Luther realized, as long as we're debating in Latin, I'm going to lose. So I have to take the discussion to the common man. Tyndale does the exact same thing. He realizes that in order for this, this conversation to have any chance of establishing the common man, he's going to have to give the common man a Bible that they can understand. And that's what motivated him to translate the New Testament. Tyndale correctly realized that the only way to establish the common man in the truth was to give them a Bible in their own language so that they could see it with their own eyes. That is what Tyndale did, and that is why he was burned at the stake with his translation. So what happens is Tyndale is betrayed and captured. He's burnt at the stake uh, along with his New Testaments that are, that, are, that are burned with him. You may remember this, and what, what Tyndale's dying prayer is, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. And he, he, he's hopeful that what will happen is, is, is that God will allow the word of God to circulate in England. And of course, we know that it does. Page 41, the vernacular Textus Receptus. The translation of the Textus Receptus into the vernacular languages of Europe was the driving force of the Reformation. Now, as you just look at Scripture, you can tell that God always intended that the scriptures be so readily available that men could search them daily. Look with me at Acts 17. Acts 17, verse 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Very clear that God's design for the scriptures is that they're so available, they're accessible, that the believer can read them on a daily basis and determine if what he's being taught is true or not true. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now as you think about that sentence, what's the subject in that sentence? The subject in that sentence is, is an understood you. When it says, study to show thyself approved, it's saying, you study to show yourself approved. So 2 Timothy 2.15 is really a command. It's a command to the, to the believer to study the scriptures. If that command exists, then God's obligated to make the scriptures available so that you can study them. It's always been God's design for his word to be available to mankind. With regard to Wycliffe, it was the translation and circulation of the Bible that gave lasting efficacy to the holy truths which he taught and was the imperishable crown of all his other labors, the treasure which he bequeathed to future and to better ages. So what it's saying there about Wycliffe, Wycliffe translates the Latin Vulgate into English in 1383. What the author there is saying is that that was his lasting achievement. Before Luther had posted up his theses, the Holy Scriptures were circulated in England. That's a reference to Wycliffe. Thus was the Reformation chiefly accomplished by the Word of God. The Reformation in England, perhaps to a greater extent than that of the continent, was affected by the Word of God. Those great individualities we met with in Germany, Switzerland, and France, men like Luther, Zwingli, and Calvin, do not appear in England, but Holy Scripture is widely circulated. What brought light into the British Isles subsequently to the year 1517 and on a more extended scale after the year 1526 was the word, the invisible power of the living God. 1526, of course, is when Tyndall completes the New Testament based upon the received text. 
think about this. I mean, here's, here's what, what God does. He takes the Greek New Testament that Erasmus prepared. Luther translates it into German. Tyndale translates it into English. There are other uh, folks that translate the Greek New Testament into the languages of Europe. And what happens with England, England is the empire on which what? The sun never sets. And so it seems what God does in his wisdom and providence is that he, he takes the Greek New Testament, puts it in English, which becomes the commercial language of the world. Engl England becomes the empire on which the sun never sets. And then that translation goes where? Around the world. The next section, we're going to look at literacy and the textus receptus. So my contention is this. The publishing of the textus receptus in the vernacular of the common languages produced a massive increase in literacy and intellectual vitality. Why do I say that? Interest in Martin Luther's teaching was so great that there were people who had never previously owned books who decided to purchase some of his writings. Now remember when we talked about the quote earlier that Luther in five years becomes the most prolific living author? Well, part of what's happening is there are lots of people never bothered to own books. The reason they start buying books is they want to read what Luther has to say. So you can decide whether you agree with this or not. What happens with the Word of God is that when you put the Word of God into a language, it changes that language and it changes that culture. So Luther starts writing. He translates the Bible into German. Now is there a real reason to learn to read? There is. Not only were people more interested in their faith, but levels of lay literacy had soared, enabling lay people to be more critical and informed about what they believed and what they expected of their clergy. With the advent of printing, books became more widely available and now lay well within the reach of an economically empowered middle class. Lay people were beginning to think for themselves and no longer regarded themselves as cravenly subservient to clergy in matters of Christian education. We talked earlier about the Renaissance and how it, it fostered a spirit of inquiry. The same thing is happening where people now are, are refusing the totalitarian nature of let the church tell you what to believe, and they're starting to think and read for themselves. The Crowlitz Bible, produced by the Hemian Brethren, quote, is the basis of the translation still in use it became the foundation of Czech literature. So the Word of God is put into the Czech language, and what happens? It's the foundation for Czech literature that flows from that. You're probably aware of this. Do people on a daily basis quote the Bible without knowing it? Constantly, right? Out of the frying pan, into the fire. That's Revelation 20, isn't it? Where people are brought out of hell to be judged and then thrown in the lake of fire. The world says you robbed Peter to pay Paul. There's countless examples of how people on a daily basis quote the Bible and have no idea what they're doing. Why is that? It's because the Bible's influence on the language is so profound. It's so pervasive. The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth. That's what happens when the Word of God gets in a language. Now, I want to show you something here. I don't know if you can read that or not. We're on, we're on page 42. Based upon the available data, it seems that the vast majority of humanity throughout time has been illiterate. So I'm quoting here secular data. You, this, you know, let me just say this as, as, as one point. One, some of the stuff we're dealing with this weekend is extra biblical topics. So you're by nature relying on extra biblical data. So we've we've gotten the best data that we know how to get. I don't I can't vouch that all of it's true because the thy word is truth and anything other than thy word I'm not so sure about. 
right? So this is the best what we have. It seems that the vast majority of, huma of humanity throughout time has been illiterate. And the re that's not an unreasonable thing to, to think. And the reason why is that throughout time, mankind has mostly been agricultural, right? And so there wasn't necessarily a commercial necessity for people to learn how to read. And so what this demonstrates is from 3500 BC, which is where they start, literacy was very restricted and closely associated with the exercise of power. And that makes sense. If you're the king, do you want your common folks reading and thinking for themselves? No, because that just leads to problems. And what, what these things show over time, starting in 1475, there was a 5% literacy rate in England, 10% in Germany. 1550, it's up to 18% in England and then 18% in Germany. And you can see how it increases over time. And, and what, what's really happened is there's been an explosion in literacy. Let me show you another chart. This, this will make it even clearer. What this is, this is the illiteracy rate. So in other words, right here is 100% illiteracy. No one can read, in other words. This is the illiteracy of men and women in England from 1500 to 1900. So let's just start in 1500. So in 1500, what this is showing is that the illiteracy rate in England was about 90% for males, almost 98% or whatever that is for females. Well, what happens in the early 1500s? Reformation. William Tyndale translates Erasmus's Greek New Testament into the English language. What do you see start from that point on? The literacy just basically disappears. I say, well, that's a coincidence. Could be. But did men start to have a real reason to read now? Think about this. Remember how in the Middle Ages, possession of the Old and New Testaments was forbidden. We most strictly forbid having a translation thereof. In order to read, you had to know Latin. The manuscripts were too expensive. And if you could get them, it was the Latin Vulgate. There's a thousand years of famine, of thirst, of dearth of the Word of God. And, you know, my opinion, you decide what you believe. What happens when the Word of God is put into the English language is people embrace it. And they learn how to read because now the Word of God is available to them. They don't just have to take what the priest says. They can now read it for themselves. You can decide if this is true or not. I think what happens is this. I think the Word of God is so powerful that when you put it into a language, it doesn't just save people, it changes the culture. It makes them readers. It makes them more well-read. It makes their thinking better. It changes society. That's what the Word of God does. Life on earth would be different if the Protestant Reformation hadn't occurred. You can decide if this is true or not. The West wouldn't be the West without the Protestant Reformation. Now think about this with me if you would. You know what happens today? We live in the information age and there's new technology after new technology after new technology. That's all the result of the fact that you have literacy so that as some scientific results are published, other scientists can read them. And then they can build upon those. That virtuous cycle of reinforcing and growing knowledge starts with that book. Now, no one will give that book credit for it. But that's the reality. People had a reason to read because the Word of God was in their language. Now let me make a point related to that. Praise God that faith comes by hearing. So think about before this. Faith doesn't come by seeing. It doesn't come by seeing words on a page. It comes by what? Praise the wisdom of God that He designed a system that allowed the illiterate to be saved throughout time. Faith cometh by hearing. All right, sola scriptura and individualism. The doctrine of sola scriptura exalted scripture as the highest authority. Scripture prevailed over everything, including man's opinion, tradition, and the church's interpretation of the scripture. 
the effect of sola scriptura was to make the individual the ultimate interpreter. If you've ever wondered why it's impossible to manage a grace church, <laughs> you know why? <laughs> because you have as many different opinions as you have people. Right? That's the natural consequence of sola scriptura. Because the individual is the ultimate interpreter. Sola Scriptura thus replaced the singular authority of the Roman Church with the unrestrained individualism of all believers interpreting the Word of God for themselves. This liberty permits an endless number of interpretations. Sola Scriptura was not simply a rejection of the authority of the Roman Church, but a rejection of all authority over the faith of the believer other than the Word of God and the believer's own conscience. Quote, the dangerous new idea firmly embedded at the heart of the Protestant Revolution was that all Christians have the right to interpret the Bible for themselves. If every individual was able to interpret the Bible as he pleased, the outcome could only be anarchy and radical religious individualism. So does Protestantism fracture over time? It does. The innate tendency to fragmentation that is characteristic of Protestantism. Quote, Untidy though it may seem, all Protestants agree that some texts are to be interpreted literally and others metaphorically. The problem is that there is no universal agreement on which text should be allocated to each category. In one sense, Protestantism de designates a way of doing theology rather than any given set of possible or specific outcomes. Next quote. It is well known that Luther's early optimism about the ability of her omnis, his term for the German people, to interpret the Bible was severely challenged by the events of the Peasants' War. So let me explain what this is. There was a revolt among the, pre, uh, among the peasants, and it, faced, it, cre, it, it, it uh, presented Protestantism with its first existential crisis. The more so because many of its leaders, to Wittenberg's great embarrassment, claim to be inspired to their gospel of social justice by Luther's teaching. So in other words, what happens is this. There's a peasant's revolt where they rise up against authority. Luther doesn't agree with it whatsoever. And folks claim they're doing it on a scriptural basis. And Luther faces this sort of crisis. Wait a minute. Sola Scriptura is the right answer. And it is the right answer. Right? Because the word of God should be paramount. But if it is sola scriptura, and the, and the individual then is individually accountable. Remember what Martin Luther said to, at the Diet of Worms? He couldn't go against his conscience. He, that was an individual decision. You're asking me to go against my conscience, and I can't do that. Luther was right. But then what happens when you apply that to the populace as a whole? Well, some people are going to get crazy ideas, aren't they? So what Sola school, school Scriptura ends up allowing is that there's all kinds of, of possible interpretations that people can come up with. And so Protestantism will be, a, in a sense, anarchy and fragmented and disorderly. That's the natural result. And so I'll close by just emphasizing this. Sola Scriptura is a blessing, and it comes with the following responsibility. It's not just you have freedom to believe anything you want. You have the obligation to study the Word of God and be biblically informed. Have you ever had a conversation with someone and what they say is, well, that's what I think and I have the right to think whatever I want? Of course you do! But you have the obligation before God to believe what He says. See that? The freedom of sola scriptura comes with the obligation to search the scriptures daily, to study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that needeth not to be ashamed. Amen. Father, thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. May you be glorified in all that we do. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Thanks, Dave. Uh, we're going to take a, a break quick. A couple things uh, to consider in the break. Um, two of the books that Dave used to teach that lesson, one of them is, is uh, Brand Luther. 
This came out. This is about the, uh, the printing press and the impact it had on the Reformation. Another one is Christianity's Dangerous Idea by Alistair McGrath. We're kind of setting out here on the front table some of the research that we've used to compile these lessons. If you want to come check these out, these are up here along with some of the other books that Jeffrey made reference to and that I used yesterday. And then uh, just a reminder, if, you wanna, if you're going to join us for the pizza, if you would uh, get your, your uh, money either to Daryl, raise your hand again, Daryl, or myself, we're going to take a 15-minute break, and at 11.30, we will have our last study of the morning, and Jeffrey will come and bring that study. We'll see you back in here in 15 15- minutes.